Sounds good. Hello and welcome to today's webinar, SB 154 Overview, Everything You Need to Know About the New SERS Requirements. This webinar is sponsored by Association Reserves. My name is Paige Sharman and I'm the Marketing Manager for Association Reserves and I'll be serving as your moderator for today. We are taking a break from our typical monthly webinar series to bring you a special webinar. Today's webinar will cover the new statutory changes that were enacted in 2023 and signed into law as of June 9th. We'll discuss what changed since last year with regard to structural integrity reserve studies and how our company is responding. Due to the number of people attending, everyone has been muted. You can ask questions at any time by typing your question into the question box at the bottom of your control panel. Please make sure to hit the Q&A button and not the chat button. Our Q&A time will be during the last 20 to 30 minutes of the broadcast, and we'll get to as many as time allows. We will be providing copies of the slides for today's presentation, as well as recording of the class. So if you have any colleagues or friends who couldn't make it today, please feel free to pass this along. And now I'd like to turn the floor over to Will Simons. Will? Thank you very much, Paige. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, this is going to be, as Paige indicated there, a, a deviation from our, our normal monthly webinar series. I know a lot of you have joined us for prior sessions where we've done the uh, fundamentals of reserves and reserve funding methodologies. And then uh, typically every third month, we do a Ask a Reserve Specialist session. Uh, but I thought this really deserves its own treatment. This is definitely the topic that everybody wants to know about and talk about these days. There's certainly a lot of questions about this new bill and how our industry is responding. And so I thought, you know, let's let's just try to get it all in one place. Uh, so I hope that my um, title for the course is not too ambitious, um, maybe a little uh, presumptuous to tell you that this is all you would need to know, but I'm going to do my best. Um, We've been having really the same conversations over and over and over again for the last few months and even going back to last year. So I thought, let's just synthesize that and put it all in one place and try to answer as many of these questions as we can. So um, thank you for being here. Uh, this, this session is not for course credit, as Paige mentioned. So uh, no need to provide us with your CAM license number or anything like that. This is just for information. Uh, but we do hope that it's going to be a useful uh, use of your time. So thank you again for joining. Um, I, I guess I do want to zero in a little bit, too, about the material. So although there's a lot to Senate Bill 154, uh, what I'm going to focus on primarily is the SERS, the Structural Integrity Reserve Study portion of that. Um, but there's a lot more to it. There's you know, milestone inspections, which I will touch on a little bit um, as they relate to a SERS. Um, but if you're looking for a, a more comprehensive overview, I know there's some good law firms out there, accounting firms, maybe management companies that have also put out content and webinars and things like that that might be useful to you. So this one is going to be a little more narrowly focused specifically on the SERS. Uh, and I'm just going to say SERS. I'm not going to say Structural Integrity Reserve Study a million times today. So SERS is, is what we're going to talk about today. Um, I, in the course of putting this together, tried to come up with as many of the most frequently asked questions that we've been getting. But certainly, as Paige mentioned there, use that Q&A button at the end. And if I haven't covered what you came to learn about, uh, go ahead and submit that. And I will try to review those and get through as many as I can towards the end. So uh, thanks for being here. Let me do a quick kind of um, introduction uh, just to talk about our company and myself a little bit. Um, so Association Reserves, if you're not familiar with us, uh, we've been around since 1986. Uh, I believe we're the oldest and largest, if not uh, maybe maybe in the top two or three, if not the oldest and largest uh, reserve study providers in the US. Uh, we've done over 70,000 reserve studies. We have clients in all 50 states. We have international clients. We have, at this point, um, 13 offices throughout the U.S. and uh, I think one more that's going to be opened uh, maybe later this year. Um, I've been with the company for about 15 years. I'm the president of our Florida office, so I oversee all of our clients and staff members in Florida. I'm a credentialed reserve specialist. I've done, in my career, thousands of reserve studies, all different types of properties, HOAs, condos co-ops, timeshares, mobile homes, uh, synagogues, churches, you know, all, all kinds of stuff. So I, I do think I'm a, hopefully going to be a reliable expert for you today. Um, 
And with respect to this topic, Senate Bill 154, I think I probably know as much, if, if not more than just about anybody, uh, just from the time that I've spent in the last two years working with um, a lot of the stakeholders involved in the creation of this bill. Uh, we were directly involved with the representatives and senators were the bill sponsors. Uh, also had some meetings with folks from the Florida Engineering Society, the DBPR, the Florida Bar, uh, really tried to um, you know, extend our influence and our and our expertise as much as we can. So um, I do have some some good insights that I hope to share with you today. That said, uh, I'm not an attorney, so if there's anything that you would like to run by an attorney, I would encourage you to do so. This is not the forum for that. Uh, if you have questions about your association specific requirements or what you may be obligated to do, um, always good to double check that with your counsel. So uh, I'm going to try to to do the best that I can here to speak in general terms about things that apply to the majority of condos and co-ops uh, in the state of Florida. Um, one last, I guess, bit of housekeeping. Um, I'm recording this, what's today? July 11th. Uh, this bill was only signed into law on June 9th. So I would say this is still kind of early days for our industry in terms of adoption and implementation of this law. So if you are watching this at some point in the future, I hope this holds up well. And uh, it, But I, I just want to point that out, that things may have changed in terms of interpretations um, as we go forward. So um, but this is this is state of the art information as far as we know it as of today. So thank you. All right. Um, tell you a little bit about my team. So uh, our you know again, Association Reserves nationwide presence, um, but specific to our Florida team, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about us. So we have 19 people in total on our staff in Florida, which is comprised of a mix of project managers, uh, project coordinators, support staff, uh, and administrative staff. Uh, we've worked with thousands of clients all over the state. I think the last time I checked, I think it was about 60% of our association clients are condos, uh, not HOAs. Um, so I did want to mention to, to any of you who are representing an HOA or if you're outside the state of Florida, um, you might want to take an early lunch today. This There's not going to be much that we'll talk about that will pertain to you. This is really specifically for, for condos and co-ops in Florida today. Uh, amongst our staff, we've got a pretty wide range of skill set. We've got a lot of talent in our staff, um, project managers with degrees in civil, mechanical, industrial engineering, construction management, business, accounting. Um, and I'm pleased to announce most recently, we've just hired a uh, full-time senior professional engineer uh, who's uh, going to be joining our team to supplement our staff and add to our knowledge base for structural elements in particular, because that's a new new focus that's brought about is this part of bill um, of the bill. So there's, uh, his name is Jeff Gunther, and you'll probably get a chance to meet him at some point in the future. I'll probably bring him along with me on one of these webinars in the future. But he's got decades of experience in Florida uh, working in forensic engineering, and uh, I think he's going to add a lot of value to our team. So um, at this point in time, we have five credentialed reserve specialists on our staff. That's the industry credential that comes from CAI, the Community Associations Institute. So. Uh, I like to think that we've got expertise in, in a lot of different domains, but uh, the way we bring all that together is, is in delivering excellent reserve studies. So uh, I think that's about enough, about enough uh, about us for now. Um, if you'd like to get more information, our website's down there in the bottom right, reservestudy.com. So I know we've got a lot of existing clients on the call today, potential new clients, welcome. Uh, if you're just here for information, thanks for joining us. Uh, hope, hopefully this is useful to you. So. As I was thinking about how to go about this, I was going back to you know my first or second grade uh, English teacher and thinking, well, if you want to tell a story, you got to think of the main the main questions, right? You know, who, what, when, where, and why. Um, and so I thought, okay, well, that's that's pretty tried and true method. Why don't we do that? But I'm going to change the order around a little bit, and I'm going to start with the why, um, which I don't think is going to come as really any surprise to anybody. Um, I'm not going to dwell on this too much. We all know the the tragic story of what happened uh, just over two years ago, June 24th, 2021, condominium building uh, called Champlain Tower South collapsed very suddenly uh, in the middle of the night. Uh, very tragically, uh, 98 people were killed and it was uh, ended up being a billion dollar legal settlement. I think maybe more than a billion dollars. Um, but I mean, in 15 years I've been doing this, there's nothing even remotely close to this event in terms of a wake up call and a 
uh, just a generational turning point for condos and the community association industry as a whole. So um, that's you can you can draw a very clear line to the the morning or the evening of that collapse and the immediate legislative response and everything that's happened over the last two years uh, to bring us to where we are now. Um, so I'm very glad to have not been a legislator in the last two years trying to solve this problem. I think it's a incredibly difficult challenge to try to figure out, you know, how do we prevent this from happening again? Um, but I like to think that our company and a lot of others uh, were very helpful in, in getting us to this point. And hopefully this is a once in a lifetime thing and will never happen again, maybe because of some of these new laws that have been put in place. So um, the, the, those of you who have been, you know, paying attention to these webinars for a while, you'll know last year, uh, we had one that was dedicated all to Senate Bill 4D. Um, that was the bill that got passed in May of last year, May of 2022, in a special session of the legislature. And that was the first attempt at a comprehensive piece of, uh, public policy that would try to address this problem. And I think it was a very good first attempt, but I think it was right, rightfully criticized in terms of some of the important details. And it really was never fully implemented. I think most people were kind of sitting on the sidelines thinking, well, let's see what happens in the next session. This one just feels a little bit half-baked and a little um, problematic, a little impractical in a lot of ways. So um, to their credit, the, the legislators all got together starting last fall and then into this spring and created the new bill, um, the new law, uh, Senate Bill 154, which uh, I think is a is a very uh, helpful improvement to 4D. But they have the same legislative intent, which, as I put up on the on the screen here, to promote and enhance the safety and the financial security of condo and co-op buildings throughout Florida in in two ways by requiring uh, professional inspections to be done and to in, impose you know requirements for financial uh, funding that would help to put these buildings in a better financial position and make sure that they're being uh, well taken care of over their lifespan. So just zooming out for a second, why are we here? Why do we have this legislation? It was all, I think, brought about by Champlain Tower South. Um, but even without that, I think this was kind of overdue. I think the state of Florida has been too lax for a long time in terms of allowing associations to kind of dig themselves into financial holes by waiving reserves and partially funding reserves. Um, so if you've listened to my other webinars, you know, we, we talk a lot about what can go wrong with buildings that, that don't have adequate financials. So um, anyways, here we are. Um, and let's talk about this most recent bill real quickly. So in the industry, you know, everyone's kind of been referring to this as the cleanup bill or the glitch bill, but it was not a complete teardown and redo. They, they didn't burn down the first one. It was more just a process improvement over Senate Bill 4D. Um, again, the heart of the bill, the legislation is the same, but there was a couple of, uh, more than a couple of ways that it was made, I think, a lot more feasible and more practical. So, um, I'll talk about these in more detail as we move through the, the session today, but just giving you a highlight, some of the things that they did do. They took out the requirements to fund or to include uh, floor and foundation, although you could argue those have now just been moved into what we call structural elements per building. Um, it clarified that the only things you need to deal with or, or account for are those that the association are responsible for. So. If your condo declaration says that windows and doors are the owner's responsibility, then that goes away. Um, I think I forgot to put it on the list here, but the, I believe it also specified that this is limited just to residential buildings. So if you're in a commercial condominium or a, uh, you know, a dock cooperative or something like that, um, I believe that those are now excluded. This is really just for residential properties. Um, some of the biggest changes they made were to expand the pool of providers of who can actually do ACERS, which we'll talk about, um, and then giving a little bit more uh, judgment calls to those providers in terms of how things would be included or not. So uh, that's kind of just a very quick rundown of, of what materialized in this cleanup bill. But I'll again, I'll go through this in a little bit more detail. So all right, so going back to that who, what, when, where, and why, let's talk about who is actually subject to these requirements. Um, 
again, to be clear, this has nothing to do with HOAs. This is really specifically for Florida condominiums and cooperative buildings that are three stories or more in height. Um, I put there that second bullet point, room for interpretation. So the way that the bill reads is it says, a SERS must be conducted for every building on the property that is three stories or more in height. Now, I think that was a, uh, a mistake on the part of the uh, people who wrote this bill to specify that it was by building. We all know that you can have multiple buildings within an association, but by and large, it's still one association. So all of the owners within that community are paying into one budget, whether or not they live in a two-story, a three-story, or a five-story building. If they're all part of one legal entity, it's one association. Uh, now, obviously, there's exceptions to that. If you have a multi-condo association where there are distinct separate budgets for each thing, or for each building, rather, that would be a different approach. Um, but the way that we are, I think, interpreting this is that if you have a condominium or co-op development and you have at least one residential building that is three stories or more, then I think you are now obligated to do a SERS. Um, whether or not all of your buildings are three stories or not, I, I think you should act as if they all need to be done in this fashion. Um, I would defer to an attorney on that if somebody gives a, a better interpretation there. But again, there's the distinction should be by the association, not by building. Um, and if you have at least one three-story building or more, um, then I think you're a SERS mandated building now. Okay, who can do a SERS? Um, so again, this was something that was not um, completely changed from Senate Bill 4D. The, the language in the bill says, uh, if you read it carefully, it actually says any qualified person can prepare a structural integrity reserve study, but the visual inspection of the property must be performed by somebody who is a state licensed engineer, architect, or a credential reserve specialist or a professional reserve analyst. So those last two credentials were something that they added to the bill this year. Um, and I think that was very wisely done because people like us who do reserve studies professionally, uh, some of them do have other licensure as an engineer architect, but the majority of professional reserve study providers um, are specialists in that field. They're not otherwise licensed, although they may have engineering degrees, architecture degrees. Um, that doesn't mean that you're licensed as a professional there. So this was a, a big um, a big improvement, really. It, it helps solve a, uh, as I, you know, a lot of people have pointed out, the imbalance of supply and demand. There's I want to say 25,000 properties that are now needing to meet this requirement in the next 18 months. And I think one way that they can help to try to uh, make that happen is by expanding the group of people who are even qualified to do it. So um, if you are a credentialed reserve specialist or PRA, you are now able to conduct the visual inspection portion of the SERS. And that's a good thing that allows a lot more associations to meet this requirement on time. So. All right, this is, I think, going to be the, the bulk of that that I'll talk about, at least in terms of segments here. What is a, a SERS? What is a Structural Integrity Reserve Study? So I've got a series of slides here that just kind of uh, talk about that in more detail and really explain what this is. So this is the actual text of the bill. Um, read this over for a second. So at a minimum, a SERS must identify each item of the condominium property being inspected state the useful life and cost uh, of each item, I'm skipping over some words here, being visually inspected and provide a reserve funding schedule with a recommended amount that achieves the replacement cost or maintenance expense of each item by the end of the remaining useful life of that item. So that, that last portion there talking about the financial funding schedule, I'm gonna circle back to that at the end in our FAQs. So that's something that a lot of people are asking about and I think are, are very confused by, but, um, this is the definition, if you will, the context from the bill of what a structural integrity reserve study is. Now, this is a listing of the specific things that are deemed structural uh, that would need to be included. So there are some, some familiar items in there, um, but I'll go through these one at a time. Some of them are obvious. Roof, um, no question, that's always been a reserve component. Structure, 
All right, so structure meaning load-bearing walls and other primary structural members and primary structural systems as those terms are defined. So to save you the trouble of looking up that other statute 627, I'll just tell you what the definition of that is. So a primary structural member is a structural element designed to provide support and stability for the vertical or lateral loads of the overall structure. Okay, and a primary structural system is just an assemblage of those structural members, right? So it's it's the bones of the building. It's the skeleton of the building that holds it up and keeps it in its form and upright. So um, if you think about that for a moment, I mean that, so again, that could include now, I think the foundation and structural, uh, you know, decks, you know, structural floors, slabs that are holding the building up. So it's not that they completely, uh, removed those items. I think now they're just considered part of the overall structure per that statute 627. Um, with respect to a reserve study, though, I mean, the, the structure of a building is usually not something you would ever consider fully replacing. There may be repairs, there may be allowances for concrete restoration for balcony and walkway decks, for example. Maybe there's garage, you know, columns that need to be restored from time to time. But this is never, I, I don't think, ever intended to be something where you do a full replacement, such as you would for a roof. So if you're having a SERS done, you could probably expect that, if anything, with regard to structure, you may have some allowances for concrete restoration. I don't see a practical way of, of doing anything beyond that. Uh, if you have structural problems greater than that, that's really a completely different scenario and, and may, you know, may result, uh, may result in a different type of solution there. But a, a structural integrity reserve study is, again, a financial planning tool at its heart. Okay, we've got fireproofing and fire protection systems. I think it's fairly straightforward there. Uh, plumbing and electrical. Those two are ones that, again, it's very rare that you would ever budget for comprehensive replacement of everything all at one time, especially with respect to electrical components. Uh, it does happen, you know, buildings built in the 70s that had aluminum wiring, for example, may need to be rewired as a fire safety risk. We do have clients that have had to do complete replacement or relining of their plumbing, but these are exceptions to the rule. I don't think that's a, a default, you know, predictable project for all communities all the time. Um, waterproofing and exterior painting, pretty straightforward, typically a seven to 10 year cycle there. Um, I think the key word there is waterproofing. So you want to make sure balcony decks, catwalks, planter boxes, anything that's part of the exterior skin of the building has got to be waterproofed. It's not just the painted exterior walls of the building. It's, it's what you can't see sometimes. So pay attention to waterproofing there. Um, windows and exterior doors, again, another change from Senate Bill 4D, which only listed windows. So now it's windows and exterior doors, but again, subject specifically to those that are the association's responsibility. So if your declaration says that individual owners maintain their own windows and doors, you can leave those out. Um, but if you have windows and doors that are common elements, right, a lobby entry, um, windows and doors at a fitness center or an amenity, amenity area, those typically do need to still be included. Okay. And then there's letter H, right, which is this catch-all definition. Anything else over $10,000, which if neglected, if you fail to repair or maintain it or replace it, might compromise something else on the list. So some examples of that, I think, could be um, balcony railings, walkway deck railings. If you've got the post pockets typically spaced every four feet where it's actually anchored into your concrete slab, that's a very risky uh, point there. That's where water can get into the slab and cause you lots of concrete restoration, which becomes a structural problem. So replacing your railings, I think, would be justified as a SERS component. Um, waterproofing of planters, waterproofing of pool decks if they're on top of a parking garage. You know, those are the types of things that you have to kind of think through. If these were not taken care of, what could go wrong? Uh, you might think of skylights on a roof. If you don't replace your skylights, or your HVAC stands, uh, those can compromise the roof structure, right? So just kind of some food for thought there. This is not a perfect black and white list. It's not gonna be the same list or the same um, approach for all buildings all the time, but this is this is what it says in the bill. All right, get a sip of water here. So a question that has come up a lot is, 
what about everything else, right? So you've this, we, we now have this list of SERS components, but I wanna make it clear that condos and co-ops are still obligated to prepare a reserve funding schedule for a bunch of other stuff, right? It's roofing, painting, and pavement resurfacing, and any other item with a cost exceeding $10,000. So elevators, cooling towers, amenity areas, um, hallway carpeting, you know, not, not always the same level of importance to the building, but some critical items there that are not structural, like elevators, that you absolutely cannot live without in your building. Okay, so we want to make it real clear that if you've done a an analysis of your reserves and you're only looking at the SERS components, um, that's only half the battle, right? You still have an obligation under statute 718 or 19 to include a reserve funding schedule for these other things, okay? Now, I, I, I guess this is just a point I wanna make clear. A structural integrity reserve study is still a reserve study, right? It is still a financial planning tool. It just happens to designate certain components of the building as structural, and as a result, those things can no longer be waived or partially funded. They are vital to the structural, physical health of that property, but it is not a license to ignore everything else. And we've been getting a lot of clients and, and you know, there's people in the industry asking, well, do we need two proposals now? Do we get a structural integrity study from one person or one company and a normal or traditional reserve study from somebody else? I don't think that's necessary. I think a good reserve study provider who's used to uh, operating in this industry can do everything in one engagement. It might provide two sets of data right? Here's your SERS reserve component list and your SERS recommendation. And here is your other reserve component list and recommendation. Your SERS things can no longer be waived or partially funded here in the near future. Everything else theoretically still could be, but it's very important that we not ignore the reality that you've got a lot of other expensive parts of the building that need to be provided for. Okay, um, there are some potential um, exclusions or, or ways that the provider has been given a judgment call to determine, hey, we're not going to recommend funding for this thing at this time. Now, these are very important. These are things that came about as a result of the cleanup bill. So I'm basically paraphrasing here to say, uh, and by the way, I do encourage everybody to read through the bill, at least the sections of the bill that pertain to this. It's, it can be a little bit dry and dense because that's just the way legal documents are written, but um, take an hour just to kind of skim through it, maybe highlight things, get familiar with the technology, or excuse me, the terminology yourself. I do think that's worth doing. What I'm trying to do here is give you the Reader's Digest version and make it approachable, but um, Basically, what I'm saying on this slide is that there are certain components of the property that if the provider of the SERS, you know, basically opines that there is not a determinable useful life or replacement cost, then those things do not necessarily need to be included in the plan. Now, they should probably state that officially, you know, make that call that, you know, with regard to electrical components for this, you know, five-year-old condo, I don't see a determinable useful life or need for a replacement on these. So we're choosing not to recommend funding. Or if those components have a remaining useful life in excess of 25 years. So for those of you who are in newer buildings out there, uh, a lot of these components may have a remaining useful life greater than 25 years, uh, especially the structural, electrical, maybe fireproofing in some cases. Um, most everything else on the list is less than 25 years. So uh, this is something we're gonna use with caution, but in some cases, I think, um, you know, plumbing, electrical, structural are the, the three that come to mind for me that somebody may come in and say, you know what, this stuff should last several decades. It's not a concern right now. And therefore this building does not necessarily need to begin funding for it, but that's, that's left up to the judgment of the provider. So, if your reserve study provider does include allowances for those things, you are mandated to fund them. Okay, so uh, the, ju the, the judgment of the provider is going to be very important there. Whether or not they include it is up to them. Um, but if they do include it, that is now a mandatory funding requirement. Okay. Uh, all right. Kind of pair these two together, where and when, to sort of round out our, um, our uh, question and answer, our uh, question prompts here. So, where is everywhere, 
this applies to all condos and co-ops in Florida. There is no difference or distinction based on location, right? Those of you who remember um, Senate Bill 4D might remember that there was a lot of emphasis placed on the location of the building with respect to a coastline, right? So if you were within three miles of a coastline, you'd have to do a milestone inspection earlier than if you were farther away from it. That has nothing to do with the SERS. You know, there is, you know, uh, buildings in Orlando have the same uh, timeline, same requirements as those in Miami Beach, okay? So um, again, it's it's the height requirement is what triggers you to be a SERS mandated property. Other than that, there's no other defining criteria. This applies to the entire state. Uh, deadlines. Okay, so December 31st, 2024 is the deadline by which you must have your SERS completed. The funding requirements, though, have a little bit of a delayed effect, and I'll explain what I mean by that. So assuming um, as most condos do, assuming that you have a December 31st fiscal year end, right? The way that the bill reads is it says, for a budget adopted on or after December 31st, 2024, that's when you may not determine to provide no reserves or less reserves than required. You have to begin funding your SERS components at that time, but it's for a budget that is adopted by definition here sometime in 2025. Now, we all know that you adopt your budget in advance of your next fiscal year, okay? So a budget adopted in 2025 would apply to 2026, okay? So for those of you who are wondering, when do the requirements really kick in? When do we need to alert our owners to the fact that this is the new normal? It's the year 2026, if you have a December 31st fiscal year end. Otherwise, if you have a split fiscal year, a July to June fiscal year, you want to really pay attention to that date, right? Because the, the legislature, legislature just says for a budget adopted on or after December 31st, 2024. So if you have a spring 25 budget, you might want to move that up a little bit if you can to try to get it before that deadline. Okay. So uh, we're about 30 minutes in, and that is the majority of the kind of content that I put together. But what I have now are some of the questions that we've been getting nonstop. Um, so I thought just to try to get out in front of some of these, I'm going to have these up on the screen and I'll try to talk through the answers as best I can. Um, and Paige, if you want to maybe start you know, going through the Q&A that people have submitted, um, if I answer their question in the course of doing this, maybe you can you know dismiss that one and we'll move on just to the ones that I haven't covered. So um, I'm going to try to take maybe 10, 15 minutes to go through these frequently asked questions, and then we'll open it up to uh, to whatever's left. So, okay, this is the by far and away the most uh, emotionally laden question that I think people are asking. What does fully funding mean, right? What do we have to do, and what do we what are we obligated to put in the bank beginning in this next year or two? So I want to make this clear once and for all. Fully funding does not mean that you have to provide the entire replacement cost of your components at one time, right? Unless, there's one caveat there, unless that component is at the end of its lifespan, okay? So I'm just going to use the example of a roof. If you have a, a roof that has a useful life of 20 years and it's 10 years old, you do not need to have 100% of the replacement cost in the bank today. Generally speaking, fully funding that roof would mean that ideally you have half of the cost in the bank, right? You would have a half of the replacement cost because it's halfway through its life. But if you have been waiving your reserves for those first 10 years, there is not an obligation to account for all that lost time all in one shot. You do not need to put 10 years worth of reserve contributions into your bank in this first fiscal year. What it means is that you have the remaining 10 years of life for this roof to collect that full replacement cost. Okay, so let's say it costs, you know, $500,000. You have a $500,000 cost. You have 10 years of remaining useful life to accumulate that cost. So you would need to put aside, you know, without accounting for inflation at the moment, 50 grand a year for the next 10 years so that when your roof needs to be replaced, it is at that point fully funded. Okay, 
So for anybody out there who is, is you know, thinking we're going to have to raise millions of dollars in the, in the next 18 months, you don't, right? Unless all of your components are at the end of their lifespan, then, you know, unfortunately you might need that, but that's going to be a special assessment anyways. So um, again, as I put here, at minimum, your funding plan must show that all components are fully funded upon the expiration of their remaining life expectancy. Okay, so I want to dispel this, this rumor once and for all. Fully funding does not mean the full replacement cost all at one time right up front. It just means you need to have a plan in place to show that you will have provided for it by the end of its lifespan. Okay, a couple more thoughts on this. This is called baseline funding. So you know, when you have pooled reserves, and I, again, I teach a whole separate class on this called reserve funding methodologies. If you haven't seen that, that might be a good use of your time to go back and, and watch that class. <clears throat> but baseline funding means that you have a pool of funds and you're contributing money to that pool each year so that as money goes in and money goes out to pay for reserve components that have expired, you never run out of money. You never drain the pool down to zero. That's it. That is all that you have to do, okay? Now, that's the legal requirement. Now, you can imagine a situation where that's maybe a little bit risky. If you are threading the needle that carefully and only putting aside enough money so that you don't go to zero, you're not allowing any room for error. You're not allowing for any surprises, any costs that come in a little bit higher than you thought or that occur earlier than you thought. So there's different objectives when you're talking about funding reserves. Baseline funding is the minimum required in Florida. There are two other objectives, which are called threshold funding or full funding, meaning you're setting a target of becoming 100% funded gradually over time. Again, I don't want to do a deep dive into that now. We've got other classes that cover that. But the real question I think that people are asking is, what are we legally mandated to do? And it's going to be baseline funding for your SERS components. Okay. Second question, um, if we did a traditional reserve study, right, earlier this year or last year, now that we have this new bill that's a month old, what do we need to do? Do we have to start over again? Um, now, this is partly my interpretation, but I have read through this bill and there is no, uh, there is a, a, a requirement in there that says the SERS must be based on a visual inspection, but it does not state that that visual inspection must be done at the time the report is prepared. It, it actually, the only language that it says along these lines has to do with milestone inspections. It says, if you have done a milestone inspection within the last five years, and typically that's gonna be like a 40 year certification, then maybe that will satisfy your visual inspection. But I'll talk more about that in a second. Um, point is what we are telling our clients, and this is me speaking for my company, if we have done your inspection in the last year, year and a half, maybe, unless there's some mitigating circumstance that would prompt us to want to go back, if you did have a structural problem, if you've done a bunch of major projects and it, it really does require a new evaluation, absent that, you should be able to just do a new financial analysis. Now, if it's been longer than that, if it was 2021 or earlier that we were the last on your property, we are going to insist on a new visual inspection. Um, this, you know, none of these bills existed prior to that. So I think that's appropriate um, and it's probably in your best interest anyways. But I don't think that there's anything compulsory in the bill that says all new SIRS must be based on a new visual inspection. If it was fairly recent, I think that should be able to qualify. But again, this is new. Uh, and if somebody corrects me on that later on, uh, maybe we'll have to change that policy. But for now, I think that's appropriate. Okay, so along those lines, can a milestone inspection serve as the basis for a SERS? Now, the bill says it can, but I'm going to say that practically speaking, I don't know how it could. The bill says, if again, if you've had a milestone done or an, an inspection for a similar local requirement, so 40-year certifications if you're in Dade and Broward County, they say that that would justify the visual inspection of your property. The problem with that is that a milestone inspection or a 40-year certification are typically a lot more limited in their scope, right? They do not always include everything there. You know, I've read some that include roofing and some that don't. I've read some that 
you know, uh, may touch on, um, you know, balcony waterproofing and some that don't. Certainly, I, I can't recall any milestone inspections that talked about fireproofing or plumbing um, or in a lot of cases, windows and doors. So <clears throat> I think from a practical standpoint, it would be helpful if you've had a milestone done. If you had a structural engineer do a 40-year certification for you, that's great. You should incorporate that into your SIRS. If they have any good recommendations, you should follow. But I don't think that you can do one and not the other, okay? Um, again, my my opinion, but um, we've had some clients that have said, hey, we just did our 40-year or 50-year certification. Do you still need to come out? And my answer is yes, because there's other things we need to look at there. Okay, a very common one here. Can we still use pooled reserves? Yes, you can. The DBPR published a FAQ page on their own website last year during Senate Bill 4D that had a clear response to this question. The answer was yes. Now, it is yes with an asterisk. However, it might require now that you have two pools of funds, your SERS funds and your non-SERS funds. Um, you know, the, the distinction here is that, again, the spirit of the law, the intent of the legislation is they don't want money that was originally intended for critical things, structure, roofing, painting, waterproofing, stuff like that, to be spent on lobby remodeling, right? So um, up until now, you could have had one pool of funds that was used to pay for everything like that. But now I think we're going to have to segregate those funds into SERS and non-SERS or traditional components. Uh, but within each of those pools, you can still use that pooled recommendation. You, there is no need to have roof reserves distinguished from painting and waterproofing distinguished from structure. They can all be part of a SERS pool here and then a non-SERS pool here. Um, as far as how to uh, do the math there, how to allocate money from one to the other, that's uh, kind of a work in progress. We have a kind of a working model of how to take a singular pooled account balance and split that into two. Um, testing that with some clients now, and I'm hoping that by next month, maybe we'll introduce that at our next webinar of, you know, this is how you do it. Um, so our company is working through that. I know other reserve study companies are working through that as well to find the optimal way to take one pool and split it into two. Okay, just a few more, and then we'll open it up to the Q&A that's in the chat here. So um, can we still waive our other, you know, non-service components? Yes, you can, but the requirement for doing so is now more difficult. So up until now, if you had a majority of a quorum of owners in the property, they could vote to waive reserve funding. So just making up numbers, you have 100 unit owners in a building and maybe a quorum is 35 people. And so you would just need a majority of a quorum, which might be what, 18 people, uh, that could carry that vote. So in reality, you have 18 out of 100 people who can determine the budget for the whole building. Not anymore. Now it is a strict majority vote of the total voting interest. So a 51, in that example, 51 out of 100 owners would have to vote to waive reserves for these things. So it is still possible, but more difficult to do. And, you know, as I've said many, many times over, we don't ever recommend waiving reserves for anything. All of these things are real costs that will need to be dealt with at some point. So if you're not funding reserves, you are guaranteeing yourself a future loan or special assessment for that project. Okay, uh, last one, and then Paige, if you wanna help me out, we'll go into the Q&A in just a second, but I'll try to do this one quickly. So um, question came up, who monitors whether associations have completed their SERS? Now, again, this is something that is new to me, but I'm not actually aware of any specific public reporting requirement. I don't believe you have to hand over your SERS to your county building official or to the DBPR or anybody else. Um, I think you need to have it if somebody asks for it. I think if a potential buyer wants to see it, it needs to be disclosed. Um, but I, I would be happy to be proven wrong or corrected on this. But to my knowledge, I, I am not aware of any formal reporting requirement. Uh, milestone inspections, I think that's different. But for a SERS, I don't think that there's any need to proactively give that to anybody unless it is asked for. Okay. All right, so that is it for now. So um, I'm gonna take a breath for a second. Paige, are you with me? I am. Okay.
Okay, I'll let you grab a sip of water really quick and okay. taking a look at the questions. We had a lot of good ones coming in, but we'll start with some easy ones here. Um, is Association Reserves qualified to do the engineering reserves as part of the milestone inspection? We are not doing any milestone inspections at this time. So um, if you are looking for that, I would say your best bet is to call a structural engineering firm, um, but we are not doing those ourselves, uh, at least at this point. All right. Does residential include timeshare associations or are they classified as commercial? That's a good question. I am not entirely sure. I, I think that generally timeshares might be governed under a different statute. Um, if so, then I would say not, but I, I'd have to look that one up. Um, yeah, again, apologies in advance. If I don't have the answer to your question, um, I will try to uh, maybe issue a, a, a follow-up where I answer some of these after I do a little bit more homework. But um, yeah, timeshares, I don't think would be residential if I had to guess. I do think it's under a different statute, but not 100% sure on that. Okay. Regarding the three stories, hasn't that been replaced with 75 feet? Uh, another good question. I don't believe so. I think the the three story requirement ties back to uh, Florida building code definition. Um, 75 feet for most buildings, if you figure most buildings are about 10, um, 10 feet per floor, 75 feet would be much taller than three stories. Um, I could be wrong on that, but everything I've read, I think up to this point still says three stories. There are some open-ended questions about if you have a garage on the ground level and two you know, habitable levels above that, is that three stories? Um, my interpretation would be that you should treat it that way unless somebody confirms otherwise. Um, the 75 foot threshold requirement, I think is more applicable to ELSS requirements, the emergency life safety systems requirements. Um, so that might be where that number is coming from. But again, that's a good question that I'll try to circle back to. I'm gonna take some notes as we go along here. So we asked about the timeshares and the 75 feet instead of three stories. All mm -hmm. right, Paige, what else? All right. Uh, what if I have a residential condo built in 2005? Is the SERS still applicable or is there a minimum age of the structure? No, it's all, uh, well, it's within the first 10 years of the CO date of the building, I think is the way it's written. Um, so yeah, if you're built in 2005, then you definitely need to have a SERS. It, it's the milestone inspections are the ones where I think it's 25. No, I'm sorry. They changed to 30 years unless a local building official says you need to do it sooner than that. So, um, but for SERS, even newer buildings have to do that. Okay. And another clarification on the stories. Is it required of condominiums that are two stories or more than two stories? More than two stories um, for the SERS requirement. So yeah, it's if, you, if your buildings are two stories tall and that's all you have, then you do not need to have a SERS done as far as I understand. Okay, is the Broward 40 year plus 10 not the same as a milestone inspection? Or is it now the same as the milestone expense? It, it, for me, it is pretty much the same thing. So for those that don't know what that question is asking about, in Dade and Broward County, for many years, there's been a requirement for what they call a 40-year certification, which then has to be renewed every 10 years after that. So you'd have a 50 and a 60 and a 70 and so on. But for the rest of the state, unless there were some, you know, cities or, you know, municipalities that had their own requirement, that those were the only two counties that had to have it done. So a milestone inspection, the way I interpret that is, is an expansion of that concept, that 40-year certification, but expanded throughout the state and shortened down to the 30-year mark. Um, so I think if you have had if you're in Data Broward and you have had a 40 or 50 or 60 year certification done recently, to me, that should satisfy the requirement for your milestone inspection. Again, check with your attorney, but the, the premise of those two documents of what's included and the purpose why you do it, I think is uh, would, would satisfy both. Okay, perfect. When are the milestone inspections and does location matter? 
Um, the first part was when are the milestone inspections? Correct. Uh, well, they're, I think, also with the same deadline, December 31st, 2024. Um, so I would say that, yeah, you want to get on that quickly. I've heard from many different engineering firms recently that they are uh, booked through the end of the year, some of them into Q1 or Q2 of next year. Um, I didn't really talk about it earlier, but one idea I have or, or kind of uh, if I had to bet, I would say that maybe in the, in the next legislative session that they might extend some of these deadlines. I think there are just so many buildings that are going to have a hard time finding qualified people to do this work that they may they may extend those deadlines or they may stagger them like by the building age, for example. Um, that's speculation on my part. So um, I would I would uh, you know at this point it's the law of the land. It says December 31st, 2024. I would act as if you need to do that and, and try to get on somebody's list as quick as you can. Okay, we have quite a few questions um, about timing. Um, so one of them is not sure I completely understand when full reserves take place. If we approve our budget in November of 2024, are we fully funding reserves in January 2025? Or when we approve our budget in November 2025, are we fully funding in January 2026? It would be in 25 for 26 with respect to your SIRS components. Okay. So it's, it, let me, uh, you know, I'll go back a few slides to that one. Um, here we go. So the way the text reads is for a budget adopted on or after December 31st, 2024. So in 2025, the association may not determine to provide no reserves or less reserves than required. And that goes on to say for the items listed in paragraph G, which are all the SERS components. So if you adopt your budget before December 31st, 2024, presumably for your 25 fiscal year, you can still determine to provide no reserves or less reserves than required. That's the way I would read that. But if the budget adoption date is after December 31st of 24, then all future budgets that would be adopted have to have full funding of surge components. Okay, so if there's an association that has a fiscal year ending in February and they approve the budget in February of that year, that would be before December 31st, 2024, unless they adopt it the next year. Is that you know, they, they didn't account for the differences in, in fiscal years for, for condos here. Um, the majority of condominium association co-ops do have a calendar fiscal year ending December 31st, but not all. But there's no provision in there that I'm aware of that says if you have a, you know, April 1 to March 31 fiscal year and you adopt your budget in January, I don't think you get any grace on that. I think it's just everybody should abide by this, this date here for a budget adopted on or after December 31st, 24. And I would maybe add to that, regardless of when your fiscal year actually starts, you need to be aware of that. Perfect. Okay. What interest rate assumption on replacement costs for serves components do you expect to use in your SERS? Yeah, so well, with respect to interest rates, um, fortunately, we've been seeing rates climbing up a little bit in the last year or two, which is nice. Um, these days, kind of our default would be starting maybe closer to 2% um, and possibly higher than that. It, it really depends. You, the, the important thing to remember with interest and inflation is that we're looking for a, a, a average number that's gonna be useful over 30 years. So, you know, for a long time, we've had very low interest rates, associations earning a fraction of a percent, even on millions of dollars in the bank. Those rates are now increasing, but they're not gonna get up to five, six, seven percent and certainly not sustain that for 30 years. So we have to be kind of prudent and careful with whatever assumption we make because that assumption is that it's going to be a good average for 30 years. So I would say something in the two to two and a half percent range is reasonable at this point. Um, less than that, I, I think is, you know, if you're getting less than that, you probably should shop around different banks. Uh, you can certainly get better than that now, uh, but wouldn't want to go too much higher than that. 
Okay, if both milestone inspection answers are needed, does it matter which is done first or should they be coordinated? It doesn't necessarily matter which is done first. I do think if you, I, I for me, the smart way to go would be to do the milestone first because that is a uh, potentially a, a more in-depth analysis. If they go from a, a phase one to a phase two inspection, that's gonna be, possibly opening up walls and floors and doing a much more in-depth review of your structural uh, elements. So I would say, if you're gonna go deep on something, do that first and then incorporate those findings into your SIRS later on. So you could do them at the same time. Uh, there may be some providers out there who are offering both, but given uh, the choice, I would say, do the milestone first, then the SIRS, or do them concurrently and make sure that the two providers are in context or in uh, contact with each other. The other reason I say that is I think the engineering firms are uh, even maybe more swamped than reserve study companies right now. I mean, everybody's swamped, but uh, I've been hearing for a long time that milestones are very difficult to get proposals for right now. So I would maybe start there. Okay. And what is the average cost of a SERS visual inspection? I'm really hesitant to give a number for that right now. Well, a couple of reasons why. Um, it's very, well, first of all, that number is going to vary quite a bit based on the building, right? So if it's a 50-story high-rise building, that's a completely different animal than a three-story, you know, 10-unit building. Uh, if it's an older building, that's probably going to be more costly than a newer building. Uh, if it's on the coast where maybe there's more of a history of major problems and projects that need to be researched, that would drive the cost up too. Um, I can, I will comfortably say that a structural integrity reserve study is more expensive than a normal one because there's more work involved. You know, the provider is, is having to include new things that were not there before. We have to do more financial analysis work on the back end to present those two sets of recommendations. Um, and there's just a market effect right now. It's a supply and demand issue. We're, I, I can only really speak for our company, but I think the same is true for everybody else that our phones are ringing off the hook. We've got a pipeline of work that is quite full already. And so um, the cost is not likely to go down anytime soon. We're, um, you know, it's just, you know, a supply and demand issue. We have hired more people recently, probably will continue to hire some more to try to meet this demand, but um, in the meantime, you know, if you're used to paying a couple thousand dollars for a reserve study, um, it's probably not going to be that way anymore, at least for, for the near future. So, uh, but, but there is a real fundamental reason for that. It is more work on the part of the provider. So, um, I would say, don't, don't be surprised if you see some pricing that's a little bit higher. Now, is it 10 times higher? No. Uh, I've heard some really wacky numbers thrown out there recently. There was a building, I'll just tell a quick story. <clears throat> We did a reserve study for last fall um, for something like $6,400 and heard that they went out to bid for a SERS this spring. And <clears throat> one of the quotes they got was $80,000, eight, zero, 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 zero. Um, so more than 10 times what we charge for them. And I, I don't know why that would be, but um, yeah, I think our industry is trying to figure out how to do these studies in the first place, what needs to be included, and different companies might have a different approach to how they do that. Um, but yeah, we're, we're trying to be as sensitive to our clients as we can in terms of pricing. Okay, we now have a new EOR. They will be doing the new SERS report, but we as an association <clears throat> already have a SERS report. Can we choose which report to use? It's a good question. So EOR there means engineer of record. Um, and so the question is, if you've got a new engineer of record doing a new SERS report and you already have an existing one, um, I've not been asked that question. I'm not sure. I guess there could be the option for the association to choose which one they want to use. I would say choose which one seems to be more accurate, more, more thorough, more professional. Um, but it kind of begs the question of if you've already had one done, why would you bother to pay for another? Um, you know, I'd have to know more about the individual circumstance there. But as to the question of uh, can we choose which to use, I think that's a good question for your attorney, to be honest. I, I don't know the answer to that. All right. Um, if we hire your company for the SERS, will we get a full reserve study, including other building needs? 
Yes. Uh, again, speaking for our company, we are not offering just a structural integrity reserve study. Our, our approach to this is we do reserve studies. And by including the things that we need to include per that list, that will qualify it as a structural integrity reserve study. But I don't want to leave our clients in the dark with respect to their other components, right? Their elevators, their all the other mechanical systems, the amenity areas, all the things that we've put into our work for decades now can't be ignored. So um, yeah, if you hire association reserves, you're going to get everything included, and we will just distinguish between which are the SERS components that cannot be waived versus everything else. Okay. Um, let's see, Paige, I, I don't know if you have a time commitment. I can go another maybe 10, 15 minutes. <clears throat> still, yeah. we, we still have a ton of questions. I still uh, see some being asked. We do have some participants leaving, which is fine. If, if you got what you needed from this, feel free to sign out. We're going to send out a recording to everybody anyways. So if you have to go, that's okay. Uh, you'll you'll still catch anything that we do for the next 10 or 15 minutes or so. Yep, uh, that's fine with me. So let's keep on going. Uh, should seawall inspections and reserving for those seawalls be included in the new report? I th Yeah, I think so. Absolutely. So if a seawall is very close to the building itself, that could meet the definition of, of a structural component, right? If, if there's a big green space or, um, you know, a buffer between the seawall and the structure, then maybe it's not structural in that sense. But either way, I always think a seawall should be included in a reserve study, um, no matter what. Yeah. Okay. Um, can funding come in the form of loan, special assessment, current reserve collections, or a combination of any or all of those? Good question. Um, in practice, I would say yes, but as per the bill, they have pretty clearly stated that this needs to be funded through reserves. Uh, I don't think that there's a choice for you to say, uh, we're going to forego our reserves because, look, we secure a line of credit or we have a loan or we're just going to special assess when we have to. Remind, remind everybody, that was how we got to this problem in the first place. You know, a lot of buildings that have been relying on loans and special assessments over the years have found that that is not sufficient, that they're just constantly chasing after projects and having to go back to their ownership over and over again for those special assessments. And they're they're not well prepared. So I think that the um, the, the primary approach needs to be funding your reserves and you know, maybe that's a question for an attorney or an accountant. If if you've already collected a special assessment and you've got that money sitting in the bank, can you consider that as part of your reserve fund and therefore base calculations around that? That that seems to make sense from a math standpoint, but legally speaking, I would defer to somebody else on that. All right. Uh, we have been given a recommendation to start a new bank account for the SERS reserves. We agree to that. But my question is, it has been recommended to not take what we have funded thus far and add it to the new account, but rather start the funding amount from scratch. Do you agree to this? Such as a roof has 10 uh, remaining useful life left and we have collected half of that. We have been advised to leave the funds in current account and start from zero dollars for the remaining useful life in the new bank account. I don't really agree with that. Um, I would need to know more about the situation if it was pooled or straight line, for example, but assuming that this is a pooled reserve fund scenario, I think it's fair to say that some balance of those funds have been collected for this you know, roof component or other service components. And so to just you know, effectively start with a clean slate and say, we're starting with zero, in the bank for these things that we're now mandated to fund, I think that puts the association at a disadvantage. If it were me, I would be able to look at kind of the relative costs and life expectancies of all the things that were represented in that first pool and maybe tease out the ones that are structural and justify some transfer of that balance into this new SERS bank account. Um, you know, others may have different opinions on that, but I think that would be kind of unfair to the association to tell them, hey, you've got money in the bank, but we're going to make you open a new account. You can't move any money into the new account. And this new one is the one that you cannot 
waive or partially fund. And so that's going to trigger a lot more money needing to go that direction, if that makes sense. So, um, yeah, I, I, I kind of disagree with that starting from zero premise. All right. Can you partially fund non SERS items without the 51% the approval? Not to my knowledge. No, I think um, under the under the statute, you have to propose a budget that shows the full funding of all your components. And if you're going to waive or partially fund anything that is non-structural, you would need a 51% vote of the owners to do that. I think that's clearly been changed in this bill that the majority of a quorum approach is, doesn't fly anymore. And it's not the board's decision either. It's, you know, the board can never make that decision on behalf of the membership. It always has to go to the members if you're gonna do something other than full funding. And nowadays, it would take 51%, not a majority of a quorum, to carry that vote. Okay. And I think this question goes back to something um, you mentioned earlier. But um, she said, I thought you could not intermingle reserve line items for some other line item reserve. So for that question, I would I would recommend that you uh, watch one of our recordings for reserve funding methodologies. But I'll try to answer it here. Um, so there's two primary ways of funding reserves, straight line reserves and the pooled method or pooled reserves. Um, so in straight line, yes, you cannot use money that is in one particular reserve account for something else. If you have a roof reserve account and you need money for a painting project, you would have to get the owners to vote to approve the use of those roof reserves for the painting work. Um, but in pooled reserves, everything is combined together. It's one sum of money that is collectively available for anything on your reserve schedule. So um, there is a prohibition against uh, commingling operating and reserve money. Maybe that is where the question is coming from. So you do need to have separate accounting, separate uh, balances for your operating funds and your reserve funds. You can't really commingle those all together. So maybe that's where the question came from. But uh, again, we do a whole hour class on the differences between straight line and pooled. I would encourage everybody, if you're not familiar, to, to check those out. Okay. Do two-story buildings need a milestone inspection, but not a SERS? Good question. Um, I don't think they do. I think Pretty much everything in the new bill is for buildings three stories and higher. Um, but I would I would defer to somebody else to, to double check that. Again, the, I haven't spent as much time studying the milestone inspection requirements because we don't do those. But I know there's been a lot of webinars and a lot of content out there talking about those. So that might be an easy answer to find. All righty. Let's see here. Do we have to account for inflation or can we use current costs? I would definitely say you need to account for inflation. So that's another thing that um, those who've heard me speak before will know that I've had a thorn in my side for years about a um, sentence in the Florida Administrative Code that prohibited balloon payments for reserve funding. And that's another thing that got fixed in this bill is it now says that if you have pooled reserves, you can make an annual adjustment to your reserve funding contribution to account for inflation, right? So you do not need to have level funding anymore where the contribution rate does not increase. So given that, that we can include increases in reserve funding, you should be also including some assumption for inflation on the costs. Yes, you know, costs go up every year. Reserve contributions should go up every year. Um, Hopefully, this is, puts an end to that that process where associations could not raise their contributions one year to the next, or at least couldn't show that taking place in their reserve schedule. All right, we are currently going through a concrete restoration and painting. How will this impact on milestone or the SERS? Um, well, it certainly would affect both. Um, yeah, if you're going through that now, keep as good of records as you can about the exact scope of work and what you're paying for that work. Um, milestone inspection should certainly take that into account because it's an evaluation of the structure. So if you are restoring everything that's bad um, and the building's going to be kind of physically sound again, 
then hopefully your milestone inspection is fairly routine. They, you know, sounds like somebody's already done that work of figuring out what was wrong and what needed to be fixed. And if you're going to paint the building and put a new skin on it and protect it, that's great. Um, so hopefully that I mean, that would definitely impact both documents. I would say if you're going to communicate the, the results of those to your provider, you know, like I said, just keep as much detail as you can. Um, remember, a reserve study is always a forward looking document. So the work that we're doing now in 2023 is looking forward to 2024. So if that work will be done by the 1st of January of next year, or whenever their fiscal year starts, we would restore the life expectancies and reflect the cost that they've just paid for that work. So yeah, it's it's something to be mindful of. Um, but uh, yeah, it would it would definitely affect both. Okay, I think we have time for one more question here. Um, what if you can't get a SERS done before mid twenty twenty four? Are there any extensions? Great question. I don't know. Um, I have not heard any public discussion of that really um i think it there's got to be something done at some point there's just i don't think it's fair to punish associations that are giving their best effort to get a quote and get this done i would say um yeah it, it would be surprising to me if the state does not allow for some extended timeline here but they haven't uh they have not done that yet and so i think you should put your best foot forward and act as if you have to do it. Um, at least document, you know, maybe show that you've sent the emails that you've requested the proposals. And uh, if if providers are saying, look, we're we're tapped out, we can't do it. Um, I think you can make a good case that you shouldn't be punished for that. But uh, in the meantime, yeah, I can't really advise anybody to count on that speculation that there's going to be an extension of the deadline. Uh, but I know to the question, I have not heard of any formal um, process by which you can request a concession or anything like that. All right, should we wrap there or do you want to take a look and see if there's No, I, I think that's good. Um, I'll go ahead and launch the um, the poll. We uh, This really isn't a CEU class, but I'll use the same one anyways, just to kind of get some feedback. This is the first time I've ever uh, kind of publicly taught all this material. I've had about a million phone conversations and emails where I've relayed these answers, but I, I do appreciate anybody's um, feedback. So I'll launch that now for those that are still here. If you want to start filling that out, we'll give everybody a couple minutes. And um, while you're doing that, I guess we'll just remind everybody this this is being recorded. So feel free to share that. Um, go ahead and send it to friends or colleagues or fellow board members. Um, anybody that might need to hear this information, that's, that's why we're doing it. This is, again, not for continuing education. This is just for knowledge. Um, and we'll have more about this to say, hopefully, as we go forward. Again, this is all still relatively new. It was just about a month ago that we got this signed into law. So things could change in the next couple months, and we'll definitely keep all of our clients as uh, up to speed as we can. Um, but um, yeah, in the meantime, I, I guess I'll just plug our company a little bit. We are still offering structural integrity reserve study proposals. Uh, we are uh, the, the best way to, to request that is to go through our website, uh, reservestudy.com, up in the top right hand of the home page, request a proposal button. Uh, if you click that, that'll send you through to our website. You fill out some information about the building and about your, uh, your yourself, your contact information, and we'll take it from there. Um, the only thing I would ask is for some patience because we are getting bombarded with these requests. We're, you know, in normal circumstances, we're usually able to respond really quick to an RFP within a day or two. Now it's more like a week or two, if not more. Um, and our calendar is getting more and more full. So there is a chance that at some point later this summer or fall, we might have to say um, we're done for now, but we will pick you up when we can. And uh We'll certainly have an eye towards that, that deadline of the end of next year. So uh, for those that, that have requested proposals, if you haven't gotten it back from us yet, thank you for your patience. We will get those as soon as we can. Um, and uh, yeah, that's that's it. Paige, you can, can you think of anything else? Any other uh, stuff we want to talk about? We've got our next month, uh, which is usually the, I think, second Tuesday of each month when we do our normal webinar series. So yeah, the next one we have is scheduled for August 15th. So um, we will send out an email for that about one week prior, letting you know uh, registration is open for that webinar. 
And um, like we mentioned before, this webinar is being recorded. So we will make sure to get this recording sent out with the presentation. And Will and I will look at posting it on our website as well, reservestudy.com. So great resource. Feel free to share it with whomever you think would um, benefit, from, benefit from the information. Yeah. And thanks, everybody. I appreciate you guys attending. This was really, uh, really well attended. And uh, we're, we're glad to do it. We'll keep you posted as we go forward. If we didn't answer your question, I apologize. We just, unfortunately, there was too many good questions and we ran out of time. But um, feel free to reach out and we will do our best to, to get back to you in a timely manner. So with that, I'll, uh, I'm going to go ahead and end the poll and uh, we'll sign ourselves out here in just a moment. So again, thank you. And we'll see you next time. Thanks.